primary, secondary, one pipe, primary, secondary. By the way, that fellow Gil Carlson, who was my teacher, he invented primary, secondary in 1954 on a problem job in New York City, and uh, and it went on to become an industry standard. So he was he was a guy that did a lot of stuff. But the primary, secondary works like this. So we got the primary circuit here, and we got the compression tank in the primary circuit, and then we got the secondary circuit over here, and we keep these T's very close together. We want to keep them so close together that there's very limited pressure drop in the common piping. So this is the common piping right here. And imagine if this secondary circulator was off and the primary is on. Well, as it enters the T, whatever goes into a T must come out. But if it can go six inches, these are not diverted T's here. This is just wide open pipe. Can you see how it'll go straight through without any flow at all going here? So if I keep the common piping pressure drop to a minimum, these two circuits can be hydraulically disconnected, meaning that one circulator is not going to affect the flow in the other circuit. So you can have a big circulator and a small circulator operating side by side, and one's not going to pick on the other. But if I start to move this piping further apart, like if I moved it out to here, can you see how the pressure drop along this run is now getting longer, and water may begin to look at this as an alternative to going straight? Can you see that? Yeah. And suppose I take this pipe and hook it in down here, like this. Wow. Now, now if the primary is on and the secondary is off, can you see how the water might go through here? And just flow backwards to that circulator, which is off? That's possible. So we don't want that to happen. So in primary, secondary, we always keep the T's as close as we can get them, ideally no further than six inches apart. That's why you'll see this always like this. And there are companies that make specialized fittings, like Taco has these fittings that are primary, secondary. There's your secondary connections. There's your primary. Uh, Webstone, which was just recently purchased by NIPCO, uh, has, a, has a delightful valve that's used specifically for primary, secondary. And what I like about this valve is there's your primary flow, and these are your secondary connections. And when I'm first filling the system and I want to purge everything, I want water to flow through that secondary circuit. So all I have to do is move this ball valve this way. It's going to drive the water through the secondary circuit. And then I open the ball valve open, uh, open the ball valve again and just leave it wide open. So that's a great product right there. So when we're doing primary, secondary, each circulator becomes responsible for only the circuit that it's in. So this guy has got to deal with the flow rate and the pressure drop of only that red loop. And the secondary circulator deals only with this yellow loop. So flow rate and pressure drop here. So they're hydraulically disconnected and they're sharing this one little bit of pipe here. So knowing that, let's look at some numbers. Suppose, for instance, we had a primary circulator that could move 20 gallons per minute. Well, if the secondary is off, 20 gallons per minute is going to sail right across the common piping and go that way. And you have flow in here and no flow at all up here. And then if the secondary circulator comes on, let's say that's 10 GPM, well, whatever goes into a T must come out. So if 20 goes in courtesy of the primary and 10 gets pulled out courtesy of the secondary at the same instant that 10 gets shoved in this side, well, then what has to be going on in the common piping, of course, is that 10 GPM is flowing that way and everything works. Now let's make it more interesting by saying the primary is 20 GPM and the secondary is 20 GPM. Well, we could do that too, because when the secondary comes on, this common piping is going to see absolutely no flow at all. There'll be still water right in this piping, because the 20 just goes this way, comes down. Whatever goes into a T must come out. And to make it even more fascinating, let's do this. Let's make the primary circulate at 10 GPM and the secondary circulate at 20 GPM. Now watch this. 10 GPM flows into this port of the T. 20 GPM gets pulled out of this port of the T. Now, how's that possible? Well, it's 20 GPM, 20 GPM, 20 GPM, 20 GPM going in here. And when it goes in there, the extra 10 goes backwards. So you got 10 going this way, 10 going backwards, giving you 20. It's coming around here, and 10 goes that way, being pulled back by this circulator. So that's how we pull the rabbit out of the hat. And what makes this even more fascinating is this water, this water here has been through radiation already, so it's coming back cooler than the water that went out. So we've got 10 GPM of relatively cool water that's mixing with 10 GPM of hot boiler water, and that's giving us a mixing point here that's being done. We have a two-temperature system that's being done without benefit of any kind of valving, no kind of tempering valve. 
And to figure out how that happens, we use this formula called the blending temperature formula, which works like this. We take the hot flow rate times the hot temperature, and to this we add the cold flow rate times the cold temperature, and that's going to give us the mixed flow rate times the mixed temperature. So a little math here. If this is 10 GPM coming out of the boiler at 180 degrees, and this is 10 GPM coming back from that secondary circuit across the common piping at 160, it's going to join together at 20 GPM at some temperature. Well, the way to know it, you got to do a little algebra here. So 10 times 180 plus 10 times 160 equals 20x. So you do the stuff on the inside of the parentheses first, and that's going to give you the 170 degrees. Easy? So let's look at this done in a way where we're hanging stuff like curtains on a rod. This is a, this is a big job. It's a quarter of a million BTU boiler. And we're working with different zones. These are high temperature zones. This is, this is baseboard, which is 40,000 BTUs. This is an indirect domestic water heater, which is 125,000 BTUs. And these are two radiant zones, each 40,000 BTUs. And we're making the radiant temperature by using three-way valves. So we're blending return water into supply water to give us the lower temperature right there. So some of the rules that you get that you follow with this, and by the way, these valves here, those are those webstone valves that help us with the purging. That's all that's that's just for startup. So the compression tank is going to go on the boiler, and we're going to pump away from the compression tank, and this is our primary loop. Everything else is a secondary loop. Now, the rule with this is we always take the hot stuff first. So the baseboard manufacturer says, I want 180 degree water. The indirect manufacturer says, I want 180 degree water. So we take the hot stuff first and the cooler stuff, the radiant, last. Common sense, right? You want to, the hottest water out of the boiler should go to the hottest need over here. And we always start with the lower load before we take on the bigger load. So hottest first, going from lower load to hotter load. Now the problem with piping this way without using those manifolds is that the baseboard guy wants 180 degrees and so does the indirect guy. But that can't be because I'm coming out of the baseboard at 160, which is going to lower the temperature to probably 170. So this guy is going to get 170 instead of 180. And I ran these numbers and found out that to make that work, pipe this way, I would have to run my boiler up to 190 degrees to make this system work. So to save fuel, let's pipe it in a different way. Let's just use these manifolds. So rather than pipe these individually, separately, we're going to come off with a hot manifold so that both the baseboard and the indirect see 180 degrees on the supply. And when it comes back, it comes back into a return manifold that's going to blend these two temperatures before it sends it on to the radiant. And I'm going to do the same thing with the radiant, where both radiant circuits are getting the same temperature water. And this works out much better. And when I run the numbers, now I could save 10 degrees constantly on my boiler. So I'm running up to 180 maximum rather than 190. So these manifolds do save fuel.